All right, let's uh, begin the service this evening, and glad to see you here. Just a few things that uh, we have to cover uh, for our up-and-coming calendars. We have Woman Up Home Cooking and Hospitality Workshops uh, every Thursday for the month of June. Uh, they will be starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, all the ladies are welcome to come. Uh, it's $5 just to cover the cost of uh, materials, food, and such. Uh, bring a knife and a cutting board. And uh, what they're doing is uh, preparing a meal, uh, going over some techniques. And then I think you're able to eat afterwards, right, and sample that. I was able to have some good potato soup uh, last week, so that was good. And uh, that's just going to get better. And okay. so uh, that'll be this. <laughs> if somebody was going to come that didn't already come, I need them to let me know so I prepare for the tomorrow too. Okay. So if you are coming this Thursday, you weren't there last, let Miss Tracy know just so that she can have the right amount of product there to uh, get the job done. Prime timers, you got movie and snack day this Saturday. Um, that will be uh, at 12 o'clock. It'll go from 12 to 3. We'll be having uh, uh, one of the Christian movies here in the auditorium. And then I think there's snack with that. Is that right? Uh, and, and so uh, uh, we've got a couple of folks that are using tables for graduations. And uh, I think we'll have enough, but uh, we should be plenty there. Um, but that'll start at 12 and go to 3. Uh, Lord's Supper will be June the 30th. We'll observe that after the morning service. And then we've got our church picnic coming up on July the 13th. And so these are the things that are coming up on our calendar of events. And then this morning we passed out our uh, five-year parking lot project, uh, Faith Promise. And um, so I just was really careful to announce that this is not in place of our Faith Promise giving for missions. We want to keep faithful to that and continue to do that, nor is it a replacement for tithe. The tithe is the, the Lord's, right? So you don't want to rob the Lord of tithes, and you want to be faithful to uh, what your heart promise was to the Lord for missions. Uh, that's a free will love offering, and this is going to be a free will love offering. We're going to divide it up into a five-year project, and then every year we're going to make uh, a pledge, a commitment, uh, to how much we want to be involved in uh, replacing that blacktop. I'm getting a quote from uh, Terry um, that he works for actually a road company. They build roads and bridges. Uh, he thought he could get us a significant discount uh, to get that done, so I'm waiting for numbers there. Uh, I don't know what that's going to be, and so I don't plan... Uh, by wishing, I plan by facts, and so uh, we've got the square footage numbered out there. We figured out how much product it would take to tear the blacktop up, put concrete down, and replace it as we go. So year 2024, we're going to make a pledge as a church uh, that money's going to be given over that time period. At the end of 2024, what we're going to do is if we have a good chunk for that year that can get us a stripe or two down, then we'll do that as that comes. That way we're replacing the parking lot, not after the whole five-year campaign, but as we go. And so the next year we'll make a fresh commitment. I want to buy uh, two, three, four, five squares of the parking lot. They're $100 a square. And however the Lord leads you to do that and be a part of that, then uh, I just want to announce we will be collecting these promises on the last Sunday of June. You tear this off, give us the big part in the offering box, and then keep the small one as a reminder for you. Also, my last announcement before we uh, pray and begin our singing is TJ and Michaela are going to Hungary for a missions trip. They've got a uh, larger uh, uh, ministry role in that. They're going to be leading a group, and uh, there, there wasn't a budget through the church that they're going for. There wasn't enough budget to work with the group that they had, and so uh, TJ and Michaela are raising some funds, uh, not, not a whole lot of money, but just something to be able to uh, do with the kids and uh, have some uh, materials and 
snacks or whatever or prizes. I, I don't know what all we'll do. Mostly craft games and something to do by way of interaction with these kids. Uh, and so they'll be leaving in July. Uh, they'll be gone for about a week and a half uh, there. And so we need to, one, be in prayer for them that uh, souls are safe, uh, safe to traveling. And then uh, if you want to give toward that, you can put that down on an offering envelope and just put hungry. And uh, we'll know that that's not hungry, but the mission trip. And uh, you can be a part of that if you like. Some folks have, have already given toward that. And a little will go a long way. Is that right? And so uh, be mindful of that. All right, let's uh, bow in a word of prayer. And then we'll stand and sing Love Lifted Me 413. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege that it is to be in your house. God, be pleased with our praise and our worship as we lift our hearts and voices to you. You're worthy. Uh, Lord Jesus, you're set down at the right hand of the Father. And Lord, uh, it's not long before you're going to come and set things right. And Lord, what a day that's going to be. But until that day, let us sing and praise to you because you are worthy of it. And uh, may it be pleasing in your ears. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Love lifted me, 413. Let's sing together. love lifted me, you're going to go, love lifted me. How many can do that? Huh? Man, hey, you got to curl your toes for that one. But I know it'll kick the devil in the teeth and God will smile for it. So let's do that last verse. Souls and angels look above, Jesus completely saves. Out of the angry waves, he's the master of the sea. stinking devil. Amen. Onward Christian soldier.
sing just as I am I come broken a broken and a contrite spirit the Lord will not despise amen, amen. <clears throat> Oh. 
got a new one that was introduced to us this morning. I'll do my best to lead it. We've got good practice on that this uh, uh, afternoon and a great message in song. Let's sing it to the Lord.
Amen. You may be seated. I invite the brew bakers to come on up. Let's just ask the Lord to meet with us one more time. Father, thank you for the privilege that it was to sing your praise. I pray, Lord, as this special is sung, that our hearts would be knit together in worship. I pray that the word of God, as it's expounded to us, draws us ever so close to you, gives us a passion and a desire to serve you together, that going forward we are pleasing to you for the purpose and work of glorifying you and seeing souls saved. In Jesus' name, amen. The song, please feel free to join in. We sang it a few times, did we? We heard it at a pastor's conference over in Wisconsin a number of years ago, six, eight years ago. Yeah, it was really, really special. Watch his love, unbounded mercy, past as oceans in their flood. Jesus brings. Of life is dying, life for us is in his blood. Oh, what hope can ever forget him? Who can seize his grace to see? A wondrous love forever cherished, while the heavens with music ring. On the mount of crucifixion, as as opens even wide. Of God's mercy, but a vast and gracious time. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured its souls in from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice, his security world in love. Let me hold thy love accepts in love the ever almighty. Let me see thy kingdom holy, and my life be to thy praise. Thou alone shalt be my glory, nothing in this world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me, thou thyself hast set me free. In my truth thou dost arrest me by thy spirit through thy and thy grace, my need is meeting, as I trust in thee, my Lord. Of thy fullness, thou art pouring, thy great love and power on me. Without measure, full and boundless, drawing up my heart to thee. Without measure, full and boundless, drawing up. My heart to thee. Still recovering from your message this morning. How do I move this thing? Man, I haven't had a crowd like this ever, I don't think. It's awesome. I love having more people to preach to. <clears throat> so as far as tonight goes, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Uh, I actually really don't like the sermon that I'm about to preach because th there is so much, I mean, there is so much in this text. Uh, and, and once, if you study the Bible like we study the Bible and you believe what we believe about the Bible, uh, the verses in here, they all have application to the time in which they were written uh, they have application to right now, and they have application to the future. Well, when you understand that about God's Word, well, it starts to become a bigger book. Uh, there starts to be more content in the verses when you're reading them. And I'm putting this together, and I'm seeing that's Jewish, and then this is for us devotionally, and this is future. And there's so much here that I just know with my finished product. Of like, Lord, there was so much, there was so much there left uh, untaught, and so much that was left off that could have been spoken, but it's just not gonna fit into uh, 40 minutes or whatever we preach. So, I mean, I got points on points on points on subpoints, 
and this is what we got. So my hope and my prayer is that tonight, uh, if it's sloppy and if it's just not making the mark, I sure hope that the Lord will use one of these incredible points that he's hidden in his word to influence your life tonight. So uh, open your Bibles to Matthew 11, uh, 25 through 30 is where we're going to be. We're going to wrap up chapter 11, and we're getting closer and closer to the parables, so I'm excited. And if we're just picking up, um, picking up where we left off last week, um, our context and where we are as we roll into this is the Jews, uh, they were finding fault and had found fault with everything that God had provided for them. It doesn't matter in what way he gave it to them. It doesn't matter who he gave it to them by. It, if one thing didn't work, he gives them the other, and they're like, nope, we don't like it. We're going to reject it. Um, they had found fault with John the Baptist and his style, his message. They found fault with Christ, his style, and his message, regardless of the presentation. So last week, we talked about how if that's you, and if you're a fault finder, and if, if that's you, well, you ruin it for yourself, and you ruin it for everybody else around you, and you see that clearer than anything um, just in the way that God brought the kingdom to the Jews and they ultimately rejected it and they, they, just, they destroyed everything for everyone. So <clears throat> we're picking up there today. Uh, we learned also that God connects judgment to rejecting his provision. And that was a really scary, just in, in sobering thought, Con- just considering that you know, you're going to be judged for the amount of grace and wisdom and truth and opportunity that God gave you. That, that, that's going to be a, a differing thing in the end. So the Jews in our context, well, they're being judged for the amount of God's grace that he gave them. So our context for today is men rejecting what God provided and then the ultimate judgment that comes upon that. So that's a long intro. Picking up in verse 25, Matthew 11. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for, it's, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, the way I have this broken down is 25 and 26, that's one point. 27 is another point, and then 28 through 30 is its own point. And all three of these little sections could be their own sermon, or multiple sermons, but we're going to do it in one. So, I know pastor already preached twice, but... Er, prayed twice, but I can't preach without praying. So <clears throat> join me in a word of prayer, if you will. Father, we thank you for your word, its richness, its depth, um, and just what you've given to us, God. There's, there's nothing else we can say other than thank you. Father, I pray that our lives um, would reflect that thankfulness based on the way that we apply your word and based on the way that we uh, just take your word to the people that we know, God. Um, our lives are supposed to speak. Do they speak? I love Christ. Do they speak? I love God's word based on how we live. Father, I pray that it would. Let this sermon, Lord, be um, just useful towards fulfilling that singular aim of glorifying you with our lives, God. Be with my speech. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Verse 25. Before we get into anything, what we have to address is we have been saying, I mean, pastor said it a bunch of times. I've said it probably 250 times since we started this section in Matthew. We have said over and over and over, the Jews rejected their king and their kingdom. Now, if you read the Gospels, somebody with a brain would say, well, you know, that's not entirely true, whole cloth. Because what you find as you read the Gospels is that not all of the Jews rejected Christ. Uh, there's actually a large percentage of them that received him as their Messiah. 
many saw him for who he truly was, and actually a lot of Gentiles received him too. So what matters here is who rejected him and who did not. So these are not going to be on your screen, but if you're taking notes, uh, Mark 12, 37 tells us that the common people heard Jesus Christ gladly. Luke 7, 29 through 30 reveals to us that all the people, the people, well, they justified God and were baptized by John. But the scribes and the Pharisees said, well, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves by not being baptized of John. Luke 20, verse 19, tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees, well, they're the ones that wanted to kill Jesus. But, well, they feared the people. Well, why did they fear the people? Because a lot of the people believed in Christ, and they believed him to be their Messiah. And Matthew 26, 3 makes it very clear that the people who were ultimately behind the crucifixion of Christ, well, it was the chief priests, the scribes, uh, and the elders of the people. You know the stories. It was Herod, Caiaphas, Pilate, Festus, King Agrippa, men in authority who were leading the charge to crucify Christ. They were the ones leading the push to reject him. What you see as you read the Gospels is that the common people well, they heard Christ gladly, and they believed on him, but it was the higher-ups, it was the wise and the self-righteous, the ones that had it all together, well, they were the ones that rejected him. And God ultimately goes with the decision of leadership on whether or not they accepted Christ as a nation, because it was the higher-ups who were responsible for the nation. They were the ones with authority. Now, I say all that to say, look at verses 25 and 26, because this is exactly what Jesus Christ is saying here. He's telling them, Oh, Father, you have hidden these things. What are these things? Well, they're the things that we've been talking about for the last 12 chapters. The things are that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the son. He was bringing a kingdom to the Jews if they would just receive it. But the wise and the prudent, well, they didn't see these things. The common people, they did. It was the lowly. It was the babes. It was the meek. It was the people who were at the bottom of the food chain, so to speak, who accepted Christ as their Messiah. But the wise, the prudent, the super smart the pridefully self-righteous, well, they reject the truth of God. So, God doesn't reveal these things to them because they had a wicked, prideful, arrogant heart. But it was the babes, the foolish, and the common, the sinners, the ones who knew, I have a need. Well, they're the ones that accepted the truth of God as it was preached. So, God opens their eyes to the reality of who Jesus Christ was. And the craziest thing about this point is that it's not in, in our Matthew verse, but in the same context in Luke, Jesus Christ rejoices at the fact that the wise and prudent are blinded and that the truth of God is not revealed to them, but that God reveals his truth to the meek and the lowly. So Luke 10.21, this is the same context, just a different retelling. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. I challenge you guys, go home, find the number of times that Jesus Christ is, is stated as rejoicing about something. There's not many. So he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. You know, it is good to God the Father to not reveal truth about him, his things, which are precious to him. It is good to him to not reveal that to prideful individuals who think themselves to be wise. And it makes God happy and it rejoices Jesus Christ to reveal those things the deep things of God, to the foolish and humble people. 
who were actually willing to receive it. And what we find throughout the scriptures is that this is God's operating procedure. Uh, No to the wise and prideful, yes to the meek and lowly. So 1 Corinthians 1, 19, 20, Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, the context of this is, is that the foolishness of the gospel, it, it destroys any wisdom that this world can produce. But what you find is the same concept. God does not deal with wise men, men or women who think, you know, I really got it. I, I really know stuff. I've really got it all together. I'm, un, you know, you would never say this because nobody would say this. Uh, you can't teach me anything. But... I find now more than ever, nobody needs taught. Nobody needs instructed because everybody knows everything. They're 20 and they know everything. I mean, or they're 45 and they don't know anything, but they've been in church for 30 years, so they don't need to know anything. Like, it just doesn't matter. People can't be taught because they are wise, God would say, in their own conceits. God doesn't deal with these people. God deals with the humble individuals, the common person who would say, you know what, there's some stuff I don't know, and there's some stuff I could be instructed in. And just as far as our age goes, God deals with the individuals who are dumb enough and stupid enough and childish enough to believe in the following things. Uh, morality, uh, sin, judgment, uh, need for God, the Bible, eternity. We could just keep going on and on and on. But our world today, uh, they've progressed past such archaic and foolish and stupid concepts as those, and they are, they're geniuses now. They are so, so, so wise. But what you find is that those people can't even be spoken to because of how smart they are. God only deals with people dumb enough to believe in those types of things. That's the only way God can make any progress in somebody's life. So if you're too smart for God, or you know more than God, or you have a better way than God, or you don't need God, well, God's just not going to deal with you. And you'll spend your entire life in darkness, and that's just how he's going to leave it. Human wisdom is 100% contrary to the wisdom of God. And anybody who thinks themselves to be wise, well, they don't know anything. And they ultimately have no part in God's revelation. Now, the leadership of the Jews in Christ's day, well, they had it all figured out. Like, they were, they they knew the law so well and so good that they took it upon themselves to make more laws. Like, they, they knew God so good, and they knew what God wanted, and they knew morality. So they took it upon themselves to just make more and more, and more, and more. They were so holy and righteous that they could expand upon God's traditions. Just like a group of people today who they they know the Bible so good, and they know what God really, really meant that, you know, they can change the book, and they can make a new version. Uh, Caleb Little informed me this week that there is now a Queen James Bible. Uh Uh-huh. Because they're so wise, and they, they really knew that they can change God's word. And there isn't anybody more lost than a wise person. So the Jews, because of their self-righteousness, they were so awesome that they didn't even need their king when he showed up. They They had this, you know, they had their government down, even though they were currently occupied by Rome. They didn't need a king, even though, you know, They were subservient to another power. So, it pleased God to not reveal to them Christ as their Messiah. Now, the common man who knew their need, it pleased God to reveal Christ as the Messiah to them. And you could say, well, it's really mean of God that he would hold, you know, he would hold 
all of the Jews responsible and not give them their kingdom, even though so many of them believed in him. It's really mean of God that he would just go with what the leadership says. But if you really sit down for two seconds and think about it, the fact that the kingdom didn't show up the first time, well, all that means is that all those people who believed in Christ and knew that he was the Messiah, well, you think that when they heard that he raised from the dead and that there was this conspiracy about his body, do you not think that all of those individuals, when they heard the apostles preaching, do you think they didn't get saved? Like, come on. Like, they missed out on their first kingdom, the physical one. So as a reward for believing in Christ uh, while they're on earth, while he was on earth, well, God just brings them into the kingdom of God, and he just brings them into the church. Try as you may, you will find no fault uh, with God in the way that he does things. So 1 Corinthians three eighteen. <clears throat> Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Now this, this verse was huge in my life. God used this verse to put me down, because I was the 20-year-old that knew everything. Like, I had it. And I told my pastor, man, I'm ready to be a pastor. And he said, no, you aren't, because you're an idiot, and you don't know anything about anything. So his counsel was, uh, be quiet, don't talk, come to everything, and learn. And then, after you have determined, or after you've humbled yourself and said, I'm a fool, I don't know anything. Well, after like three, four, five years of learning, well, then maybe, maybe you can teach a Sunday school class because this is serious. And I took that serious, and the Lord used this verse in my life to humble me and then exalt me. So here's a warning for you, Christian. Learn from the Jews' response to God's provision. They were too wise and too smart, and, and they knew everything, and they had it all together. They didn't need what God gave them. That's many Christians today. And the way that you learn, the way that you have the Spirit of God reveal truth to you so that you can teach or so that you can be useful to the body, well, the way you do that is through humility. The way you go up is you first have to go down. The way you get to the top is that you first go to the bottom. The way that you get in front is you go to the back. That, that's how God works. So you learn by asking questions. Not by saying, oh, yeah, 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 I know that. Oh, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's not how you learn anything. You learn by saying, I don't know. And you learn by asking questions. That, that's how God has this set up. And the thing that I have found more frequently now than ever, nobody has any questions. Everybody knows everything. Yep, I, I got that. When you know as soon as the words come out of their mouth that they don't got it, and they don't know it. But if they had the humility to say, man, I, I don't know that. Would you sit down with me and, and, and help me see that? Well, then they grow. But people don't have the humility to do that. Now, if you are so smart and you know everything, if you know more than your pastor, and if you think that you should be the one teaching, and, you know, I'm, I can correct other people because I know so much. Or you know what? When there's people in the church and they're asking questions, I'm the guy. I am answer guy, even though I don't teach a Sunday school class and I'm not the pastor. And I'm... If that is you, God's advice for you is to become a fool so that you can actually one day become wise because you don't know a quarter of what you think you know. And then if you don't become as a little child and humble yourself before God and submit to being taught, you know, God will catch you in your own pride and wisdom, and he'll ruin you so that you can learn humility. That's what he did in my life. Or even worse, because this is way worse. God will just allow you to be wise in your own conceits, and he'll let you go, and he'll let you go do what you want, and you'll just ruin yourself. And then when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it'll all have been for nothing. Humble yourself before the Lord and in your church 
and then you'll be taught, and then you'll be instructed, and then you'll be raised up so that you can be valuable. Verse 27. So we already touched on this, but Jesus says himself in verse 27 that God has to reveal truth to somebody before they could ever get it. Like it that's the only way this works. Like, you're not so smart that you learned it. You know, or you're, you're not so awesome that when you heard the gospel, you were so great that you just were like, oh man, that makes so much sense to me. And I just gotta get, I just gotta get me some of that. You weren't that awesome. The only way anything ever gets done is if the Spirit of God does the revealing. So what was the thing that the Jews saw or did not see? Well, it was Christ. They either, they either saw him as the Messiah or they didn't. So the Father said at Christ's baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist said, hey, that's the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. He did all of these miracles. And then the son says, oh, I am my father? Well, we're one. Before Abraham was, I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the father. Like it was about Christ the whole time. They either saw or didn't see him. And a person sees or doesn't see based on their heart condition. God won't reveal this to the prideful and wise in heart. Whereas he will reveal this to those that are simple and humble. And don't miss this because Jesus flat out says, you will never know the Father unless the Son reveals him to you. And this is true. No lost sinner gets saved just randomly or out of the blue. They get saved because the Holy Spirit of God illuminates their heart when they hear the gospel preached so that it shines the glory of Christ into their heart. And then based on that, well, then they make a decision of whether they are going to reject or whether they are going to accept. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, so God shines the light, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God does the shining and if, there's, if God's not doing the shining, then there's no saving, and there's no revealing, and there's no understanding. So now the Calvinists, they love these verses. There's a bunch of these in the Gospels. Like these are their favorite ones to say, yep, see, that person, they didn't get saved because Jesus Christ didn't reveal the Father to them. You want to know why? Well, it's because they weren't elect. Like, these are their verses that they use to bolster their, their uh, election ideas. But if you keep going in verse 28, Jesus absolutely destroys all of this nonsense with his follow-up statement in 28. So in 28, we've got the Great Commission, we've got the Great Commandment. Well, here you have what we can call the Great Invitation. Verse 28, Come unto me, some of you that labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me, all ye that are elect. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The invitation made by Jesus Christ goes out to all men. People don't get saved. Here's the, here's the reason. One among many. One of the reasons people don't get saved, if you're wondering, is because they don't have the humility to answer the invitation. He's calling to all, but the invitation carries with it this little tiny prerequisite of self-humbling and self-humiliation and admitting that you have a need. So you first have to come to Christ and say, you know what? I, I am heavy laden. I am burdened. I am a sinner. I have a problem. I have a need. But what you find in our world is that people don't have a need. We've talked about this in the past. There's nothing wrong with them. They have everything fine. They're doing well. God wouldn't actually judge them anyways because he's way too loving. I mean, whatever, however you want to spin it, that's what the world is teaching today. And they teach that through all of their various different means 
And people hear that their whole life. There's nothing wrong with them. They're a victim. They don't have a problem. So when they hear the gospel, well, they just scoff at it and they reject it. Well, our job as soul winners, as you go out into the world and you're communicating with people, your job is to help people recognize their need. Like that, that is primary. That is that if you don't do that, and if you don't establish that, you don't have to walk away asking yourself, man, why didn't that person get saved? We talked for four hours. Or, you know, I, I was so clear in my presentation. Well, if you never establish with them that they have a need, then who cares that you're bringing them a solution? It doesn't matter. Our job is to help people recognize that they're really just as bad as the next guy. What people do is they puff themselves up based on their moral standards or their righteousness or their positions. And the thing that drives me insane more than anything else is listening to uh, moral virtue signaling Republican type people talk. They're going to talk about how, oh man, I'm against abortion. Man, that's the worst thing in the world. Or man, oh man, the homosexuals, they're taking over. We got to stop these guys. Or I'm a, you know, I'm a far writer. Well, what they don't understand when they talk that way, if they're not saved, is that, you know what God thinks about their positions and their stances and their standards and their righteousnesses? Well, God says in Isaiah that they're filthy rags. He doesn't care that they hold these positions. He doesn't care how long they sit down and they talk about these things and, oh man, the world's crazy and we got to fix it. God doesn't care. The only thing that God cares about is someone's position before Jesus Christ. He doesn't care about anything else. John 14, 6, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So did you come in to the Father at Christ? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then God doesn't care about your, your virtual signaling and your morals and your whatever or whatever you're going to puff up yourself with, or your self-righteousness. He only cares about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And a person has to first come before God and say, I fall short, Galatians, or Romans 3.23. I fall short of the righteousness of God, and you know what? I, I'm worthy to be judged. If somebody can't make that step, or if you can't get them there, then nothing else matters, because they're not they're not going to get the gospel and they're not going to hear it. And they're not going to understand it when you preach it to them. Because God reveals these things and he moves for the humble, not the proud. This is huge. This is huge for our witness. When you are interacting with people, your goal should be not to just talk about God, not to just talk about the Bible. You need to talk about Jesus Christ. You need to talk about their need before God. That's what you need to address. And then, if you could just get that established, you can then point them to the individual who has the solution. It's huge. And here's the thing that I love the most, John 12, 32. Jesus Christ invites all men to himself. Well, here's this little thing in 1232. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So for the Calvinist, well, a person only gets saved if the Holy Spirit moves in their heart and draws them. Well, Christ says in John, if I be lifted up from the earth, which he was, well, then I will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ has promised to draw all men. He invites them and he draws them. If somebody's not getting saved, it is because they don't have the humility to answer the invitation and come. You have to have that nailed down. When you're thinking about your doctrine and when you are interacting with people, God has done all the work. They have to come. And that takes humility. 
So in the church age, someone's eternity is based upon one thing. What did they do with Jesus' invitation? John 3, 35 and 36. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Like, you, how do you make it any simpler than that? This text didn't say anything about somebody's political stances, their, you know, their moral standards, their, you know, whether they feed the orphans or not. Like, it, it didn't say anything about that. Because as far as salvation goes, and the only thing that matters is Jesus Christ. That's it. And if we're going to effectively witness and be evangelists and soul winners, you have to have that nailed down. That has to be your focus. So now back to the Jew. I went way off. <clears throat> Everything for the Jews concerning their kingdom that Christ was bringing in, well, it all comes down to Jesus. Like, it doesn't matter how you slice it. He's telling them, if you need rest and you want rest, but you have to come to me to get it. You, you can't go to anybody else. And we believe that Christ is God. That, that's kind of a big deal around here. But you just, you understand the audacity to make a claim like that? Oh yeah, if you want peace in your life, come to me. Like, human leaders and men have been making claims throughout all of history to say that, you know, they could they're going to get a program going or they're going to, you know, work something out to bring peace on earth. But I don't, I mean, how many men have had the audacity to say, if you want peace, come to me personally and me individually? That's a ridiculous thing to say unless you're a God in the flesh. Christ made it very, very clear to his people, the Jews, I'm God, I'm your Messiah, I'm the one that's bringing this thing in, and you're either going to come get it from me and you're going to get on board, or you're just, you're just not going to get it at all. Put yourself in the shoes of a flesh and blood Jew who may have been raised alongside Jesus Christ in their young life. And a guy says, come to me for peace. Come to me for rest. We take for granted the fact that we get to believe in Christ by faith and without seeing him. Like we, you have all the information. All, you have all this to prove that he was God in the flesh. And you didn't have to struggle with the fact that you saw a man. It's a great privilege. And we, I mean, we, we rag on the Jews pretty hard. But you can only imagine how difficult that would have been for them. But what they had to do, because they saw a man, is they had to humble themselves and they had to submit to a man, a flesh and blood man, who's saying that he was God. And this was before he rose from the dead, mind you. Now, the cool thing about this, <clears throat> and this is where I'll be moving towards my conclusion here. <clears throat> Doctrinally, Jesus isn't just talking about, you know, Rest like I'm anxious and I have anxiety and I need internal rest. That's how this passage is used. It's, it's either used to say, I need rest uh, and that's my salvation, or I need rest because I have anxiety in me. Like those are the two ways this passage is usually preached. But doctrinally, Jesus isn't talking about either of those things. Hebrews 3 verse 18 <clears throat> says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now what's the context of Hebrews 3? What's the rest that God was trying to give to his people that they didn't get, in, didn't get to go into? Well, it's the land of Canaan, the promised land, the thing that the Abrahamic covenant was all connected to. I'm going to give you guys rest on earth, and it's going to be amazing, and it's going to be great, but... They didn't believe, so they missed it. Well, it's the same thing with Christ. He's bringing them a rest on earth 
that was going to be a perfect rest, a thousand-year rest, a kingdom rest. But they didn't believe it. So they don't get to go in because of unbelief. They didn't answer the invitation because they didn't believe in him. Now, if you have your Bibles, it's probably better to just flip there. It will be on the screen, but uh, look at Hebrews chapter 4. This is your real context for the rest that Christ was offering them in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Verse 1. <clears throat> Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left, of, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached should not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do in, enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So here's your key, verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So you have, in Genesis 3, a creation period that spans six days with a seventh day of rest. Well, why did God do that? Well, it certainly wasn't because he was tired or because he needed a nap or because you know, he expended too much of his unlimited almighty God power that he needed a break. What we learn throughout the scriptures is that God establishes a seventh day, a Sabbath day of rest and peace. And we've, I know pastors covered this in the past, probably a bunch of times, but you connect this in with church history and the, the timeline of the world, and what you have is a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So you have 6,000 years, six days of human history. And then a seventh day comes, a day of a thousand years of rest and peace on earth. This rest that Jesus is offering them, that they were supposed to come to him to get, connects to the seventh day. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> Again, he limiteth a certain day, not in there on accident, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, he didn't give them rest the first time he came because they hardened their hearts and rejected their king. Keep going. <clears throat> then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So who's the book of Hebrews written to, church? Hebrews. Who are the people of God historically and overwhelmingly throughout the whole entire Bible? The Jews. There is a rest that pertains to the, to the people of God that Christ was bringing to the Jews at his first coming. He invites them in, and they don't accept. This is our context. This is what Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 is really talking about historically and doctrinally. We can make the tie into the church age because we have a church age. But before there was a church age, the context of this passage was the millennial kingdom of rest that Christ was offering these people. The exact same thing that we were talking about up at the top of the Matthew 11. The stuff that you have in your Bible isn't there on accident. The way that things progress from paragraph to paragraph, verse to verse, God didn't just, oh, I'm going to write a book. Like, oh, I got nothing else going on. 
I might as well just throw some random facts in here for them. Everything in your Bible is connected. This is, this is why God's given it to you. So why didn't the Jews take it? Well, it was connected to admitting that they were worn out. Look at verse, I believe it's 28 still. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. A person, if they were going to go to Christ for the rest that he was speaking of, well, they first had to own the fact that they were heavy laden. I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I need help. I can't do it. And why would a Jew say such a thing? Why would a Jew be so burnt out? Why would they be so, you know, tired and what? It's almost like they were working for something. Deuteronomy 6, 24. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. Verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness, if conditional, we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. The Jews were given statutes and commandments to do, so that in doing them, they would then earn or gain or work for their own righteousness. Imagine for two seconds how burnt out you would be, and how, if you have any humility whatsoever, you would have to say, every night when you go to bed, I don't know. I sure hope I wake up tomorrow so that I can do better tomorrow than I did today because today I totally blew it. They would have been burnt out and they would have been completely toasted. And it was the religious elite and religious leadership of that day that said, no, our righteousness is good. Our righteousness is great, actually. Look at how much we've expanded upon the righteousness you gave us. We did so good that we even... We're even righteouser because we added our own stuff. And then you have the common man, the prostitutes, the tax collectors that would say, you know what? We're actually not that righteous. Our righteousness is, which we were supposed to earn, well, we actually did a really bad job at that. And we're actually really tired and we're actually really burnt out. And you know what? We actually really have a need. Well, those are the people that went to Christ. It was the prideful and the self-righteous who were unwilling, Hebrews 10, to cease from their own works. The only way you got into God's rest is if you ceased from your own works and said, you know what, my own works, they're not good. I need you and not me. And ultimately, here we are in the church age, you know, 2,000 years later, and people are still doing the same thing. The Jews told Christ, we don't want your work, at least the leaders. We don't want your work. We want ours because we're really awesome and we really got it together. Well, you have people now saying, with salvation being a free gift, where, where 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that you could be Christ's righteousness. He could give you that. People say, I don't want your work. I want mine. I want my stances and my morality and my fill in the blank. I don't want the work that you did for me on the cross because that requires me to say that I have a need. And I'm not doing it. I will not say that I have a need. And just like the Jews, through their pride, they lost everything. And the people who won't humble themselves and tell Christ that they have a need, they'll ultimately lose everything. They'll gain the whole world, and they'll forfeit their own soul, which could have been saved for free. So no matter how you slice it, everything comes down to Jesus Christ. If someone, if they're going to get wisdom, well, they have to first humble themselves and go to Christ to get that wisdom. And that applies to lost or saved. Your wisdom isn't good enough. It doesn't matter 
Like, your experience, God doesn't care. Like, what you've been through, if you're using your experience and what you've been through to determine truth, God does not care because thy word is truth. And if your word, or if God's word and your experience go like this, eventually your experience has to drop off so that God's word can be magnified in your life. And if that's how you're going to be, if you're going to be motivated by your wisdom or your feelings or your emotions, you will never progress. You have to humble yourself and go to God's word for all of your wisdom and all of your truth. And if someone's going to get saved, they have to humble themselves and go to Christ for it. Their, their righteousness is not good enough. And ultimately, because I just don't have time to do this last point, and I honestly, I saw that it would have been an amazing point way too late. So we're just not going to be able to develop it. But <clears throat> if your life is going to be of any use or of any value to God, I mean, you're saved, great. But if your life is going to do anything for the Lord before you either get raptured or end up six feet under. You ultimately have to humble yourself, leave yourself and all of your ways behind, and your preferences and your desires and your fill in the blank, and you ultimately have to submit to Jesus' yoke. That's what he's, I mean, that's what he's talking about in verse 29 and 30. And if you know anything about yokes or the way that that works, you got to get in there right next to him. You need two to go forward. Well, the one isn't going to just pull the other. If the one recognizes that the second one isn't doing anything, well, it'll just stop. It's fine. We just won't go forward. You're here, and I want to. I want to go. But if you're not submitted to going forward my way, because it's my yoke, if you're not going to do that, then we just won't go anywhere. And that's just where we'll leave it. We call this yoking under Christ's yoke. We call this discipleship. We call this uh, becoming a Christian. This is actual Christianity. You get with Christ, and you get through obedience and submission and humility. You get conformed to the image of Christ as you follow him. Last verse, 1 Peter 5, 6. <clears throat> Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that, ye may, that he may exalt you in due time. Don't let pride and an unwillingness to humble yourself keep God from raising you up to what you want, ultimately. He won't make use of your life if you're prideful and arrogant and non-submitted. Miss Trace, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so I'm all over the place. That was a lot of different points pushed into one sermon. <clears throat> 